external guests uh, and to my new students who are joining us tonight for their very first lecture on their degree. So I'd like to talk uh, tonight a little about the context of the voyage, the ship and the voyage itself, and then uh, what happened after the voyage, which is perhaps just as, as important. So we'll start off with two maps. We can see on the right a map of Southampton close to the time, um, around 1650, and on the left, modern Southampton. And on the map on the left, the red line shows the city wall and the edge of what was the west quay of the town, now reclaimed from the land and uh, reclaimed from the sea rather and developed. Um, in the 1600s, this area, along with Town Quay, which still exist at the south point of the city, really was the main port area of the city. So in July 1620, we saw the arrival in Southampton of a ship called the Speedwell, carrying a small English religious group from the Netherlands. Anchored just off of the west quay of the town, probably on our, our map there, um, somewhere in the modern day car park for the Quay Swimming Centre, was the Mayflower, a slightly larger ship with even more passengers on board, loading for a transatlantic voyage alongside the Speedwell. Uh, the passengers on these two vessels have permission, and I, I would put permission in double inverted commas, and funding to start a trading settlement in the colony of Virginia. Uh, at the time, the colony of Virginia extended far further north than the modern state of Virginia, uh, right up to modern day New York, and the area was under the control of the Virginia Company, which itself effectively reported to the English Crown, and it was being run as a commercial basis. Uh, so what do we know about the ships and the voyage that carried the passengers? Um, it was only some of the passengers were travelling for religious reasons, it wasn't, wasn't all of them, uh, to North America. And how did it change the, the course of American history and culture? Um, and surprisingly, we actually know very little. So let's just start by, by putting this in context into the, the time timeline for the North Atlantic and shipping in the North Atlantic. Um, Schools traditionally told us that Columbus discovered the Americas. Um, that's absolute rubbish. Obviously, the, the people who were living there first would, would argue with that too. Um, in terms of European travel across the North Atlantic, um, the first records we have and the first hard evidence we have is around about 990 to 1050 Common Era, when there's evidence of Norse sailors visiting Newfoundland. Um, that evidence is in the form of Norse buildings in Newfoundland that have been carbon dated. Uh, the closest point of Newfoundland is only 750 miles from Greenland. Uh, Norse families are known to have settled in Iceland and settled in Greenland, so moving further to the Americas is not really far in the global sense. Distance-wise, it's about the same from Iceland to Greenland. Uh, and in fact, there have been maps discovered in Iceland in 1570 that show the American coast but with Norse names but with different features. And then there's some tantalising evidence and, and hearsay that in 1480 and 1481, sailors from Bristol landed in North America. We know that sailors from Bristol were certainly looking for new fishing grounds. They had traditionally fished around Iceland, but there were issues with um, or political issues which limited um, their ability to, to fish there. So they headed west looking for more, for more fishing grounds and, and more fertile fishing. Uh, so it's very difficult to find exact hard evidence for this, but what we do know is that merchants and sailors in Bristol were always interested in sailing west for, for effectively promised fishing grounds and better fishing. Now, uh, then in 1492, um, uh, Columbus lands in the Bahamas. Um, Columbus wasn't actually looking for the Americas, he was looking for Asia. Um, he thought that if you sail a couple of months west of from Spain, sooner or later you'll hit Asia. Um, so he was really interested in a trading route through to Asia and really, I think, didn't expect to, to find what he did. Then in 1497, a gentleman called John Cabot lands in Newfoundland on a vessel called the Matthew. And there's a replica of this in Bristol today. Um, he lands on Newfoundland. He, he's one of the first Europeans to, to set foot there um, after the, the Norse, after the Vikings. Um, and the Bristol fishing fleets follow. Um, the fishing there is really, really good, hence place names that they're given like Cape Cod. And then in 1519, we have the Magdalene circumnavigation. Um, this is the first geographic circumnavigation to cross all the longitudes of the globe. So in seafaring terms, quite a significant event. Uh, 
And although not directly linked to sailing across the North Atlantic, but just to put it into context and give you an idea of some of the evidence available, in 1545, the Mary Rose sinks. That's followed, um, fairly closely followed in 1577 by Sir Francis Drake's circumnavigation. So just 30 years before the Mayflower crosses the North Atlantic, ocean travel and navigation is still very much in its infancy. And then by 1607, there is more trade across the North Atlantic. The Jamestown settlement, the first English settlement, uh, starts. Obviously, a, a very checkered history for Jamestown. And then in 1620, we have the Mayflower itself crossing. Um, initially from Southampton, as we'll see, with a, a slight diversion. In terms of sources of evidence, um, there's actually not a, a huge amount. The best contemporary evidence of the voyage is from one of the passengers, William Bradford, who actually ended up as the, the governor of the, the settlement. Um, he recorded the history of the voyage and the settlers between 1620 and 1651 and recorded it all in, in a Plymouth plantation a record effectively of his, his experiences and this really is the primary source of data for an awful lot of, of the information that we have. There are some other accounts mostly after the landing and in the form of journals and letters but in terms of primary evidence it's really quite limited. Um, Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation was rewritten by Arbour in, in 1897 and published as the story of the Pilgrim Fathers uh, as told by themselves, their friends and their enemies. Um, he really changed the language to make the language a little easier to follow, perhaps from, from the English of the 1600s. We don't really know how much detail perhaps he, he adjusted, um, as, as is always the case with, with records that aren't contemporary. Um, but as we'll see, there's, there's actually very little evidence on the Mayflower itself, frustratingly. So we actually, as I said, know very little about the ship. Um, at the time, she wasn't notable, she wasn't special, and um, actually because of the religious activities of some of the passengers, they faced arrest or religious persecution, so they probably kept a really low profile. Uh, we certainly wouldn't have seen them departing from Southampton with the modern sail away cruise ship celebrations and fireworks. Um, and in fact, we, we know so little about the Mayflower that the first reference we have to the name Mayflower isn't until 1623, three years after the voyage, in the official records of the colony. The evidence that we do have though suggests she was about 30 to 33 metres in length uh, and if we use modern media measures of size that's three London buses um, and she was of about 200 tonnes burthen. Now burthen is a, an obsolete nautical term for capacity whilst a tonne spelt t-u-n was the largest cask of wine that uh, the ship could carry, holding 252 gallons. These casks could be subdivided further and further, and each particular type of cask had a name. So we can measure the capacity of the ship in terms of the number of tonnes it carries, or its tonnage. Now, Bradford tells us about hiring two ships, suggesting another was hired at, uh, at London of burden about nine score, or 180 tonnes. So we've got a bit of discrepancy already in, in the accounts of the size of the vessel. Um, this is perhaps really not surprising as there wasn't a complete method at the time of determining tonnage or an accurate method of determining tonnage or a, a consistent way of doing so. Um, but obviously we, we still use the term tonnage today, international shipping, to determine the capacity that uh, a ship can carry. So uh, to all intents and purposes, we, we measure ships, even in modern ships, by how much alcohol they can carry around the world. The first record of her trading was in the Mediterranean, uh, transporting wine in 1609. Um, there is some evidence of her trading in the North Sea. Um, this was to Trondheim in 1609, taking cargo from London to Norway and then another cargo back again. There is some evidence that in a storm in the North Sea, they were forced to jettison some of the cargo, um, which may suggest that she wasn't a particularly good sea boat in short, steep waves, typical of the North Sea. Um, it's maybe a bold extrapolation, but Perhaps it's a good indication of her suitability maybe to cross the Atlantic uh, with remaining records uh, of her, all her journeys on, on far more benign routes. And even by the scale of, of shipping at the time, she was really quite small. Um, in terms of volume, we're talking of 180, 200 tonnes. At the time, Spain was building warships around about 1,300 tonnes. So really quite small in the, the, the um, particular scale of, of shipping. So shown here in the, the photo is Mayflower 2, 
uh, a replica built in the UK in the 1950s as a post-war gift from Britain to the USA. Um, she's actually just been restored for the Mayflower 400 commemoration. Um, the original design was undertaken by uh, William Baker, a naval architect at MIT, who was also a distinguished historian, uh, using the methods from the time. But actually, we know so little about the Mayflower itself that we can't really be sure how accurate it is as, as a replica. Um, certainly followed the rules of the time, but things like colour and so on, we, we certainly don't know about. Um, she was very likely to have been built with castles fore and aft for defence. Um, the castles are, as we can see in the image, the raised sections of deck towards the front and the rear of the vessel. Um, at this stage, cannon was and artillery was fairly well um, advanced in, in naval terms and had been used for some time. Um, the castles really were perhaps gave a, an advantage for guns and gunnery, but also to a certain extent were maybe a little bit of a hangover from the days of archers on ships. And let's not forget, um, it was only well, less than 100 years previously, the Mary Rose had capsized uh, and there's there's evidence of longbows and archers on her. Um, so it's it's a sort of point in time of evolution of shipping, going from one style of, of vessel to another. Uh, the cannon that she carried would have been for self-protection. The seas at that time really were lawless, uh, with a very significant risk of piracy, particularly Corsair pirates who operated uh, all the way from the African coast, Mediterranean coast, all the way up to Iceland and really were a very well organised uh, group of people who looked at merchant ships as, as effectively a source of income uh, on a very, very large scale. So the vessels at the time needed some sort of, of self-protection. And actually at the time as well, the Royal Navy really didn't exist. There was a small standing navy, uh, an army of ships as, as it was referred to, um, but not the, the professional Royal Navy that we would see a couple of hundred years later. And in times of need, ships were expected to be taken up from the merchant trade to form the defence for the country. And in fact, the Speedwell, the, the smaller vessel that uh, the Mayflower sailed alongside initially, had actually sailed in battle against the Spanish Armada. In terms of construction, she would have been built this what's called carval construction. Uh, this is a method where each plank or strake of the hull butts up against the next one and is sealed to the next plank, rather than a more primitive clinker method where each panel overlaps um, or the edges overlap. By using this carval method, we could build ships which are stronger and therefore we can build bigger ships, particularly wooden vessels and allows better strength. So at the time, some of the evolution of ship design is based around this, this method. One of the things that we really don't have is any drawings of vessels at the time. Um, there are a very few surviving technical drawings from the era. And actually evidence suggests that that there are no technical drawings of English built vessels at all pre-1550. Um, data is really limited to artistic representations that may not lack detail or proportion or um, really don't give us from an engineering or science point of view enough of a background. Um, despite the, the numerous paintings of the Mayflower and images, there are no paintings or drawings of her from, from the time that she was afloat. There's no primary evidence from, from there. And it gets even harder to try and work out what she would look like because there were very little repeatable or standardised processes in shipbuilding at the time. Rules of thumb were the primary method and differed greatly between different builders, especially as there were influences from different countries changing the design of ships. Now, shortly after the Mayflower, Samuel Pepys, who was the administrator of the Navy, complained that shipwrights were, in his own words, gouty, illiterate, intemperament and ill-conditioned men who understood their craft so imperfectly that they could not explain it to anybody else, uh, which is uh, yeah, quite an insult of the, the time. Um, each shipwright had their own methods, their own variations for designing and building the vessel. And other than Archimedes' principle, there wasn't really a lot of scientific base, basis behind it. Uh, let's not forget this is, is before Sir Isaac Newton, before a number of eminent scientists who actually all looked for, for ships and shipping as an area of interest. Um, so really we knew very little scientific basis to build on. Um, it was almost a case of trial and error and of building successful ships and then in evolving the design for the next vessel. So in terms of ship design, um, the ships were, or the design of a ship at the time, would be started with a sweep or an arc to create the cross section of the vessel at the middle. And these were, were based on different ratios with different sensors to create a complex shape out of a few individual curves. These were linked together to create the ship cross section. These would then be drawn at full scale to represent the shape of the frames of the vessel with wood cut and shapes to form the frame. Uh, these frames would then be assembled 
and planking added over the top to create the watertight hull process. So we didn't really, or they, they didn't really start from a particular drawing and then complete the vessel. It really was build the section, build the next section, build the next section, and build up the design as they, they went along. Uh, the section shown in here is from uh, a well, hydrography published in 1643 by Fournier. Um, this was really one of the first attempts to sort of try and, and write about shipbuilding and record it. Um, what was interesting about this is that this is, is say, one of the early attempts to define the scientific principles of shipbuilding. And in it, he refers to this particular diagram here um, as the basis of the historical design for ships. And he actually refers to it and calls it the ancient method. And then very frustratingly, doesn't tell us any more about it. So all we actually have for, for much older ships is this particular cross-section drawing, which we can try and decipher, but doesn't really give us a huge amount of information. Fortunately, though, we've got a little bit more information on the hull shapes of the time from a document from 1586, which is preserved in, in Samuel Pepys Library by a Matthew Baker. And this is called The Fragments of Ancient English Shipwritery. Uh, Baker was actually Queen Elizabeth's royal master shipwright. Um, his father was Henry VIII's royal master shipwright and was the person credited with moving the guns lower in a vessel to give it more stability, but then require gun ports, um, hence the, the, um, the Mary Rose. Now, this document actually gives us some really good rules of thumb for shipbuilding at the time, which really maybe give us the best idea of knowing what she would have looked like. What he tells us is that from 1570 onwards, the cross sections of the hull become more complex with three separate arcs forming this cross section with lots of different centers joining the arcs together. Uh, the hull design at this point is almost certainly evolving as sailors and shipwrights travel further um, with increasing distances for trade, exposing them to more different types of vessels, more varied vessels from different cultures. Each of these would have been designed for slightly different local sea conditions, predominant wind conditions, cargoes and wind strengths and so on to give an optimum design for, for those local requirements. And a lot of those designs got fed back into the, the whole world of shipbuilding. Um, they would have also had access to vessels from a number of countries that were captured in the process of war and, and sailed back as prizes. Um, but we can see from the diagram here, the cross sections on the left, we've got a cross section from the middle of the vessel and on the right, a cross section towards the bow of the vessel. And we can see the difference between them. Um, these would form the, the basis of the frames. Uh, this image here is the, the Mayflower 2 replica just before being relaunched after her, her restoration. And we can actually see that from some of the shape of the hull, the shapes of some of these arcs and cross section that make up the, the shape of the vessel overall. So in terms of sailing performance, we, we know a little bit potentially about the shape of the hull and the size of the hull. Um, but again, in terms of performance, we don't really know a huge amount. Um, Sailors today measure directions in 360 degrees, but at the time, sailors measured direction with 32 different points around the compass, as shown on the compass rows on the right here. The, uh, the square rigs of the time were very limited in the direction they could travel compared to the wind, so they could only sail at very limited angles compared to the wind, um, typically described as no better than six points to the wind. Um, if we assume that the wind is coming from the north, so here's our wind on our compass rows coming from the north, Six points to the wind means that the vessel can sail in any of the directions of that green arc, but not in any of the directions of the red arc. So you can see in terms of the wind direction, our vessel is very limited as to the angles it can sail to. If you want to travel in the direction the wind is coming from, you have to zigzag backwards and forwards through the green section to be able to do so. Now, the hull shape itself is also causing us a problem here and the, the windage, the, the shape of the castles would have resulted in what we call a very large leeway angle. Um, the leeway angle is as a ship sails along the difference between the direction the bow is pointing and the direction the vessel is actually moving in. It's effectively the, the angle the vessel crabs through. For a modern sailing vessel with a good optimised hull, that's about two or three degrees. For a vessel like this, evidence suggests it would have been more in the region of about 10 degrees, possibly slightly more. Um, so actually, the ability of our vessel to, to go in any direction that it wants to is really limited by the direction that the wind's coming from. And that's an important point that we'll, we'll come back to shortly. Uh, in terms of speed as well, very difficult to, to absolutely know for certain, but we can extrapolate some data. 
the speed of ships at the time was likely to be extremely slow. Again, we have very limited data from the period, but from the mid 1700s onwards, there's actually an incredible wealth of data in the form of ships logs. Um, captains of ships at certain frequencies every couple of hours would have to make a note of the weather conditions, the speed of the vessel, the heading and so on. All that information goes in the ship's log books and those ship's log books then went into archives ashore. So they provide an, an incredible, amazingly detailed database of climate and ship performance all around the world, all the way from 1700 onwards. Um, and these are actually used in climate studies as well as, as historical climate data. But taking that information, we can get an idea of how ships might have performed and how fast they might have sailed. So the, the data from the ships of the East India Company, uh, bearing in mind these would have been bigger ships, more powerful, probably a little bit faster than the Mayflower, shows that in 1750, pretty much whatever the wind condition you could go sailing in, you weren't going to be able to do more than about five knots. That's about 5.7 miles an hour. It's really obviously quite slow. Um, we can see from this graph that that increases quite a lot over the next 80 years. Um, that increase perhaps maybe is due to improvements in hull coating, which make the hull slipperier, um, stop barnacles growing and so on, which helps to improve speed. Um, it's also down to being able to remove the castles from the vessel as cannon become more popular and more powerful. Um, the broadside becomes the primary method of, of fighting ships at sea. But if we extrapolate this data back to, to 1620, um, it really suggests that the Mayflower will be particularly slow. And in fact, we know that she took 66 days to cross the Atlantic. and We'll, we'll look at the speed later on. Um, but it does suggest that she really wasn't very, very sprightly at all. At this stage as well in history, we know very little really about the hydrodynamics of a vessel moving through the water and the way to optimise the hydrodynamics. Um, Baker tells us that the ships at the time were built on the principle of a cod's head and a mackerel's tail. Um, possibly on the basis that cod swim quite fast and mackerel swim quite fast, therefore half cod, half mackerel should swim quite well. Uh, this meant that a lot of the volume of the ship was forward underwater rather than distributed in a way that gives us a better overall distribution of volume and less drag. Um, so it really wasn't a particularly efficient way. And I think modern logic perhaps says that, um, that if you want a ship to go fast, you don't necessarily design it after a fish. And in fact, we know that at about the same time in Asia, ship designers were looking quite carefully at ducks and, and swans as they were able to paddle on the surface of the water and to move quite quickly to try and work out what made them efficient. So perhaps maybe a, a bit more of a logical process. So this is a technical presentation, so we've, we've obviously got to have some graphs with some lines on. Um, so what I've been able to do is to have a look at the sea keeping performance as well. So we know about the direction she can sail, we know about the likely speed, but we should also know about the motions and the, the sea keeping. Um, the sea keeping performance of her would have been incredibly poor by modern standards. Um, motion sickness or sea sickness actually occurs not from the speed that we move or the distance that we move, but from accelerations, from how we accelerate, and primarily how we accelerate up and down is what causes us to be motion sick. Um, the larger the accelerations, the, the greater the chance of us being ill, and the faster we'll be ill as well. Um, there is a fairly gruesome piece of research called the Motion Sickness Incidence, or MSI Index, which actually lets us predict if somebody is likely to be sick as a result of motions. Um, certainly we would want to be involved in the experiments that, that brought that about in the first place, but it is really useful data that naval architects can use today to try and minimise passenger and crew discomfort on a vessel and to ensure that human performance isn't unduly reduced by motions and acceleration. So what I've done here is created a virtual model of the Mayflower and used modern software to analyse her motions and to see how she would move in the water and assess the hull uh, accordingly. So what these graphs show is predictions of the vertical acceleration at a point in the forward accommodation area of the vessel where many of the passengers would have lived from the crossing. The vertical axis, the, the up and down axis, shows us the acceleration due to the vessel's predicted motion. So it said larger accelerations, greater result or greater chance of seasickness. And the horizontal axis shows what we call the encounter frequency. Now the encounter frequency is how often the vessel hits the peak of a wave. So an encounter frequency of one hertz means that they hit a wave peak every one second, 0.5 hertz every two seconds, 0.25 hertz every four seconds, and so on. 
and the dashed lines show the lower limit for human performance either for two hours exposure or eight hours exposure. So we can see from the graph on the left hand side for a head sea when our vessel is sailing into the seas and into the waves that an encounter frequency around about 0.2, so that's a wave impact every five seconds, and a boat speed of two knots would give us our worst case scenario and that we could expect most people to be sick after about eight hours. So not a particularly pleasant topic, but it, what it shows is that the sea keeping of the vessel really wouldn't have been very nice and you, you certainly wouldn't want to be on it um, for, for 66 days. In a following sea case where the water the waves are coming from behind, it's even worse and we can see actually that under certain circumstances within two hours the majority of people on the vessel would have been ill. Um, we should also perhaps bear in mind that the ship didn't have any toilets, just buckets, so that the conditions on board really would have been horrendous with these sorts of motions and those sorts of living conditions. So let's have a, a look at the voyage itself. So the details of, of Mayflower's departure are actually clearer than the details of the voyage itself, again mainly thanks to, to Bradford. Um, there are some primary accounts by the other passengers, but they don't really give us as much detail about the voyage itself. Um, but William Bradford's account, as, as rewritten by Arbor, gives us some very useful details. We know from, from these accounts that the Mayflower was hired or chartered for the voyage, whereas the Speedwell was actually purchased outright by the passengers. Uh, as we mentioned, the Speedwell was already an old ship by this point. It had fought against the Spanish Armada um, and was maybe perhaps not in the, the best condition. The Speedwell brought the, the Pilgrim Fathers from the Netherlands to Southampton, where they joined the Mayflower in, in taking on stores and planning the voyage. And after taking on the, the food and supplies that they needed, they departed from Southampton on the 5th of August. Um, so well before the, the actual final departure date from England. However, the Speedwell started leaking really badly, um, bad enough that they needed to divert to Dartmouth for repairs. Um, Bradford tells us in his own words that Master Reynolds, the master of the lesser ship, complained that he found his ship so leaky as he durst not put forward to sea till she was mended. Um, following repairs, Bradford then optimistically notes that she was thoroughly searched from stem to stern, some leaks were found and mended, and it was now conceived by the workmen and all that she was sufficient. Uh, we should perhaps accept that comment with the caveat of, of Pepys' comments on shipwrights of the time. So we're ready to depart from, from Dartmouth on the journey. So following the repairs to, to Speedwell, they depart again. Um, Bradford tells us that about 100 leagues without Land's End, which means about 350 miles past Land's End, which just puts them just south of Ireland, the master of the small ship, which was the Speedwell, complained his ship was so leaky as he must bear up or sink at sea. Now, there's obviously no lifeboats on these vessels, there's no RNLI, there's no search and rescue. Sinking would have been the, the end for the vessel and her crew and passengers. So they return to Plymouth where the passengers really decide to cut their losses and just to use the Mayflower. So some of the passengers give up on the, the journey, others stay, and the Mayflower takes on 102 passengers and probably for a vessel of that size, around 50 crew. So this, uh, that's actually an interesting conspiracy theory around this. Um, the crew of the Speedwell were hired to spend a whole year in the Americas. The Mayflower really was just chartered to take them to America um, to wait a couple of weeks and to return back to, to England. So the crew of the Speedwell perhaps were, were getting less keen on the idea of going to the Americas. Um, Arbor tells us that the leakiness of the ship was partly by being overmasted and too much to press with sails, by the cunning and deceit of the master and his company, meaning the crew of the ship, who were hired to stay a whole year in the country and now fancying dislike, plotted this stratagem to free themselves as afterwards was known and by some of them confessed. So a little bit of, of perhaps of, of misbehaviour going on here. It is to be fair to them, though the Speedwell was carrying a new larger rig, which she was originally designed for. If you put those extra forces into the vessel, those extra forces might cause the hull to move a little bit more. And that would certainly open up the seams and cause quite a, a quick leak. Um, so maybe have some sympathy for them. And I think realistically, we, we also have to look at the context of the time. This is an incredibly high risk voyage. There's a whole host of dangers. Um, it really be clear to people that there's a significant risk of, of death. Um, at the time, we know from various accounts, there were probably 20, 30, 40, 50 vessels a year crossing the Atlantic, somewhere in that sort of region, um, but certainly not routine travel. 
So they put to sea again. They they depart from Plymouth with a prosperous wind, which can sit, uh, continued divers' days together. Now, divers is, is the term from the time that means several, uh, and was encouraging to them. Yet, according to the usual manner, many were affected with seasickness. So again, from the, the information we have on the motions, which says it really probably isn't very pleasant, uh, we've now got some evidence to, to back that up. Uh, then Bradford tells us, after they'd enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, they were encountered many times with cross winds and met with many fierce storms. Well, certainly the North Atlantic at that time of year isn't really somewhere you'd want to be. The dark line here on the map shows their approximate course. If I look at the predominant winds in the North Atlantic, particularly that time of year, they run in that direction from Newfoundland up towards the UK. And the Gulf Stream follows that pattern as well. So our vessel would have been sailing significantly for, for most of the passage into the wind. Um, and as we've mentioned, these square rigs don't sail into the wind. So if we take our compass rose and we put the wind direction back on it, really the best direction for most of the voyage they'd be able to sail to is either towards Greenland and the um, magnetic North Pole or south towards the equator. It would have taken a long time to zigzag across the Atlantic effectively as, as they would have needed to do. Um, as discussed previously, the, the sea keeping and the motions would have been very poor. Um, Bradford tells us repeatedly how seasick the passengers were. And in fact, one of the first things in the account, he tells us, um, perhaps with a, a little bit of, of, of glee, that um, there's a, a sailor, well, the sailors on board who really seem to enjoy tormenting the seasick passengers, telling them that he'd like to throw them overboard and to take their possessions. Uh, and unfortunately for this particular sailor, Bradford tells us that he had a grievous disease, of which he died in a desperate manner and was himself the first that was thrown overboard. Um, that was actually the only death on the voyage, which again, quite remarkable for the number of people on board. Now, we know also that June to September is the peak season for hurricanes in the North Atlantic. There was a, a particularly unpleasant hurricane called Hurricane Paulette moving up from Bermuda towards the, the route of the Mayflower right now. Um, many of these hurricanes track up the eastern coast of the modern USA. They lose power and become tropical storms, but they're still incredibly dangerous. And these do actually peak every year in mid-September. Um, so it's entirely possible that the Mayflower encountered the end of the hurricane season, um, perhaps the remains of hurricanes with a tropical storm length on her journey. Um, we know from Bradford's account, there are some times on the journey where they simply had to drift without any sails up at the mercy of the wind, riding out storms. And actually at one point, there was serious structural damage to the vessel that they were only able to fix because they'd taken tools with them to build houses when they reached their destination. Um, ironically, perhaps had they had the Speedwell not had a leak and had they been able to sail a month earlier in August, they may well have missed the worst of these conditions. If we look at the distance from, from England across to, to Hudson Bay, where they were originally aiming, uh, the distance is approximately 2,750 miles. Because of the curvature of the Earth, it wouldn't appear as a straight line on our map. It would be a slightly curved route known as a Great Circle route. And actually, if we take the shortest distance, we would go through Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. So their track itself would be a little bit longer than 2,750 miles. And if you include the tacking that they would have to do because of the wind direction, it would be significantly longer. Um, as you said, the accounts tell us that the voyage took 66 days. And if we look at that distance in 66 days, that tells us that they were traveling in the right direction at an average speed of just 1.7 knots, so really not very fast at all. And they would have been sailing against the Gulf Stream, which would be continually pushing them back towards England. Um, so really not a particularly easy voyage for them um, and no doubt a, a very unpleasant experience. So obviously as they're sailing across, they need to be able to navigate and they need to be able to find their, their particular destination in the States. So there are two essential pieces of information that a sailor needs to know where they are. Uh, the first of those is their position north or south of the equator. Now, in this case, north of the equator, uh, as shown here by the red lines, and we measure that as latitude. I'm sure you're aware of that. And also, we need to know our position east or west of a particular datum point, which is the longitude, as shown by the, the highlighted white lines. Obviously, we take the longitude, the datum point, normally to be the Greenwich meridian, uh, often now referred to as the prime meridian. And for latitudes, the datum point is the, the equator. Uh, in the early 1600s, navigation was actually amazingly advanced. 
as a science, it's far closer to what we would see as modern navigation, um, perhaps than a science like medicine. So it really was a, uh, a, an interesting developing area. To be able to work out their latitude, there were a couple of, of processes and possibilities that they could use, but they would most probably have determined it based on the pole star. Now, the pole star in, in the huge scale of space is effectively a bit of a crude analogy, but directly above the North Pole. So as the Earth rotates, the pole star appears to be stationary. Um, what this image shows here is an amazing time lapse photo um, from a high latitude of the night sky as the Earth rotates. Um, we can see all the stars effectively rotating, or not rotating, but staying where they are as we rotate around them underneath the pole star. Um, the bright line across it is, is an unfortunately timed aircraft. Um, so whatever time of night or day it is, the pole star is, is in theory the same place pointing north. As you move further and further south, the pole star still points north, but more of this view gets blocked and the star effectively gets low on the horizon. So if you measure its altitude above the horizon, which decreases as you move south, you can begin to work out how far north and south you are. Now, they had various instruments to do this. They had astrolabes, quadrants, which were a forerunner of the modern sextant. But this process, reliable as it could be, particularly on land, all relied on having clear skies with no cloud and being able to measure very accurate values from a rolling deck of a small vessel, which we know was pitching really badly. So to be fair to them, very, very difficult to accurately measure their, their latitude. Even trickier, is the longitude. Uh, there were a few methods to measure the relative position of the moon against stars, which they could use, or moons around planets, but the accuracy of this was, was really quite poor. To really accurately measure longitude, sailors needed to be able to accurately measure the local noon. Uh, local noon is the point that the sun is highest in the sky. But as the Earth spins, this happens later and later as you move further and further west. So for example, between London and Bristol, we'll find that local noon in Bristol is actually 10 minutes after noon in London. Uh, if you visit Bristol, have a look at the old corn exchange clock, because it's actually got two minute hands on it, one for Bristol time and one for London time, and they're 10 minutes apart. So for every one degree that we travel west, noon occurs four minutes later. So at 15 degrees west, the first of the highlighted white lines here, just you know, running through Iceland, noon would be one hour after London. So for sailors, by comparing the local noon time and measuring the height of the sun to a known location, they could work out in theory their longitude. This did, however, though, need a very accurate clock. Um, sadly, the accuracy of clocks in the 1600s varied considerably. Um, as you can imagine, a, a grandfather clock with a pendulum is fairly useless on a rolling ship. Um, and things like temperature changes made any other form of, of clock very difficult. Um, so we really didn't see the first truly accurate clock, the Harrison H1, uh, tested at sea until 1736. So for the Mayflower, calculating um, of the longitude would really have been quite challenging. So what they did instead in the 1600s was to have a series of hourglasses, of sand glasses, with the crew continually turning them to mark four hour watches or shifts, and smaller glasses used to measure every half hour to, to back those up. So effectively, they kept their own stopwatch running from start to finish. Uh, and even today, the normal watch or shift on the ship is, is a four hour pattern. Now, every half hour that they would sail, marked by the, the hourglasses, would result in a record, or they would make a record of the course and speed being recorded on something called a traverse board, which was an early form of, of record keeping. It was effectively a board with holes that they put pegs in to record their speed and direction. Uh, they would have had a compass to be able to record the direction of travel. The compasses have been used for, for hundreds of years prior to this. Uh, so they'd have been relatively accurate. Um, they would have been influenced by the motion of the vessel um, and any ferrous objects. At this stage, they did actually know about magnetic error and the geographic North Pole and the true North, uh, and the magnetic North Pole. Um, so they would have been able to account for that. Um, they would have also been able to measure their speed by throwing a board with a line attached to it out the back of the ship. That line would have had a series of knots tied into it at fixed intervals, and they'd count the knots over a certain time frame. And from that, they could work out the speed, which is again why today we refer to the speed of ships in knots. So after their, their four hour watch, they could take the results of the speed and direction that they got on their traverse board as a record. And they would use some tables and a process called deduced reckoning to work out the position of their vessel relative to the start of the four hours. So they could keep this process going up all the way across the Atlantic, obviously getting less and less accurate 
um, as errors build up and compound, but it would give them an idea of where they were in terms of both latitude and longitude. Now, to be honest though, knowing your position accurately, even, even to a very high accuracy, is completely useless unless you've also got accurate charts showing you the relative positions of dangers and land. Uh, let's not forget that Columbus sent out, uh, set out thinking that Asia was just a couple of months sailing directly west of Spain. Um, Captain John Smith, who was one of the survivors of, of the Jamestown settlement, surveyed much of the coast of, of the area. He actually named it as, as New England and published a map in 1616. We know that the Mayflower purchased a copy of the map even though their intended landing point was the Hudson River, so south of the, the coverage of the map. Um, some areas of Smith's map are, are actually claimed to be accurate to 10 miles, which is incredibly accurate. Um, what's even really interesting about Smith's map as well is if we look at their final landing place where they set up their settlement, we can see in 1616 it was called Plymouth. So actually it was a complete coincidence that the vessel sailed from Plymouth and landed in Plymouth. They didn't name it Plymouth after their departure point. It just happened to be a, a happy coincidence. Um, given the accuracy of navigation at the time, though, this, this level, this, this accuracy for, for maps is really quite remarkable. Um, even today, seabed mapping is a very complex and horrendously expensive process. Um, less than 20% of the world's seabed is accurately mapped to high enough levels of accuracy for, for navigation purposes, really. Uh, and even modern charts carry data for mariners and warnings on them telling them when the surveys were undertaken. And this data can be surprisingly old. Uh, I looked up earlier a modern map of Cape Cod, and there's a warning on there that some of the surveys that created the data were actually undertaken between 1900 and 1939. So um, in some cases, perhaps up to 120 years old. So we can see the map here in, in a little bit more detail. Just for a, a comparison, I'm just gonna overlay with Smith's map, the modern Google Maps for for the area and we can see around Plymouth just how accurately the coastline resembled uh, Smith's map. Um, really quite impressive for the time and the, the instruments available. So after 66 days at sea the Mayflower sights its first land of, of the North American continent at Cape Cod. Now they were aiming for the Hudson River um, on a north-south basis Cape Cod is only really 65 miles north of the Hudson River, so quite incredible for them to cross the Atlantic over, over 2,750 miles and be that close to their destination latitude. The problem for them is they're actually on effectively the wrong side of, of Cape Cod. So on arrival, they realise that they're north of where they want to be, and so quite logically they turn and head south, initially with, with fair winds to, to push them. Um, but Bradford then tells us after they'd sailed that course about half the day, they fell amongst dangerous shoals and roaring breakers, and they were so far entangled there with as they conceived themselves in great danger. Um, to be honest, they were absolutely right. Um, if we look at the modern chart of the area, there are shoals and rip currents, very fast currents, marked south of the Cape in an area known as the Monomon Shoals, which is just marked here on the map. Um, the water depth here dropped very rapidly from 15 metres to two metres. That's definitely shallow enough to ground the vessel and to, with the, the waves to wreck her. So sailing through this would have been incredibly dangerous. Uh, what a prudent captain of the time would, be, would do is to say, well, I've sailed up to this point, I've arrived at this point, I'm, I can't get out of this, I'm gonna turn around and go out the way I came in. So they turned around and sailed off again to the north. Now, if we look at this in detail, we can see why with the shapes of the, the, um, the, the rocks and the seabed here, it's very easy to get trapped in a, effectively a horseshoe where you wouldn't be able to, to leave again. So having successfully sailed north, they decide eventually to settle in Plymouth, um, which John Smith on his maps had noted would, would make a good settlement. Um, but this actually gave them a real headache. And this is what maybe makes the Mayflower crossing a bit different to some of the other crossings. Um, the Mayflower wasn't the first crossing. It wasn't the first settlement. It wasn't the first English settlement. But they're now in a position where their change in plan means that they've landed slightly north of the colony of Virginia, uh, which at the time extended up to Long Island. Um, it was the colony of Virginia, and again, using the word in, in double inverted commas, but where they had permission to settle. Um, this means that effectively, having landed outside the colony of Virginia, they don't have a contract to settle and they don't have any laws to follow. They may have well have ended up on a deserted desert island. 
So their solution was to draw up a democratic agreement called the Mayflower Compact, which governed them independently from England. Um, they would appear to have been quite honest with it. That the idea was that they it would govern them until they could obtain permission to settle where they landed from England. Um, but this actually turns out now to be pretty much the first Western example of a consensual government without a monarch, um, effectively governed by the people for the people, all agreeing to, to a set of rules that they developed and devised. So ironically, had their navigation taken them just 65 miles further south after their trip across the Atlantic, they would have landed in the colony of Virginia and history and, and the development of the, the North American continent would have been very, very different. So after the voyage, um, it's sometimes said that it's, it's better to travel than to arrive. And unfortunately for the passengers on the Mayflower, that was, was perhaps true. They suffered a very harsh winter that they weren't expecting. Incredibly difficult living conditions in New England that took their toll. Uh, whilst just one passenger died on the voyage, half of the passengers and half the crew of the Mayflower died in the first New England winter, uh, mainly as a lack of, of food. The ground was frozen solid, so they couldn't, um, couldn't sow seeds. Uh, there was poor diet since departure and incredibly cold conditions and scurvy uh, took its, its toll. Um, the Mayflower actually intended, as I said earlier, to sail home relatively quickly, but the captain made the decision that they had to stay there until enough of the crew really recovered to be able to bring them back safely. So quite sadly, the, the Mayflower is used as this floating base. And then in April 1621, Mayflower tells us that she departs back to sail back to the UK. Uh, with the prevailing winds, she, she would have had a much faster voyage home. There's some evidence to suggest that she got home at twice the speed that she sailed out at. Um, sadly, the, the final records for the ship are just three years later. Um, her captain, Christopher Jones, was also part owner of the vessel, and he passed away three years after the voyage, which left the vessel in probate. Um, the records from the High Court of the Admiralty show that on the 26th of May, 1624, there was an appraisal for the vessel, um, describing her really as being not in good condition and worth £128. Um, it quite likely at this stage, um, especially considering the damage from the crossing and the, the lack of the of maintenance um, that she would have had while the crew were ill, that she was probably towards the end of her working life. And she'd certainly been trading since, since 1609. Um, she would have been pushed very hard on her transatlantic voyage. We know that she suffered damage. Um, we don't know for certain when she was built, but for the condition she's in, possibly understandable that that was the end of her working life. So any wood or equipment or anchors and so on would be salvaged and the vessel would be broken up. And we've got this fantastic painting here by Dr. Mike Haywood. Um, I have to say thank you to the copyright owners, the, the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, who very kindly gave me permission to use this, this brilliant picture, shows the Mayflower at the end of her life on the banks of the Thames at Rotherhide, 